Many countries in Latin America are learning tough economic lessons at the moment and experiencing extremely challenging circumstances. But one country that has emerged as a success story in the region is the Republic of Chile. After enduring years of crushing poverty, the nation has evolved into one of the wealthiest in the region. Many say Chile serves as a model to the rest of the world. Joining us now is a man who played a pivotal role in making that happen and rebuilding the country. He is also the author of a new book called The Southern Tiger, Chile's Fight for a Democratic and Prosperous Future, which details that journey. Former Chilean President Ricardo Lagos. President Lagos, thank you for visiting our studios and welcome. You know, on September 11th, we are remembering the 40th anniversary of the Pinochet coup in 1973. And during those years, you were arrested by the Pinochet secret police. You were also one of the opposition leaders who helped transition the country to democracy. Forty years later, do you think Chile is still divided? Well, unfortunately, I think it's very difficult because what happened during those uh, 17 years of dictatorship, many of uh, remembrance, the guns are still open. And therefore, it's very difficult to be able to... But at the same time, I think that we have had a very good transition, as you say. We have not been able to accomplish everything, but the question was, and was a big discussion during those days, what kind of transition? And at the end, we decided to use a plebiscite that was uh, taken into account in Pinochet's constitution in order to allow him to remain in power an additional eight years. And since we decided that it was possible to defeat him in a plebiscite, at the very end, after 70 years, there was a plebiscite. We prepared for that. We registered. We registered political parties. We prepared people to, to be in the polling station. And at the end, we won. And I think that was very important that the transition was through democratic means, through the ballot, and not the ballots. Well, I'd like to ask you about the transition, because Chile is still ruled by the Constitution from the Pinochet area. Why weren't you able to change that? It's simply because the kind of uh, element that has that Constitution, the electoral system that very uneven, the quorum that you need to change the Constitution, it was in my period that I was able to change the major elements that make that constitution undemocratic. But the electoral system, I couldn't change. The quorum, I couldn't reduce. And it seems to me that now, in the next presidential election, probably this is going to be mass, and it's being now discussed as one of the major elements in the presidential election that is uh, th three, three months from now. I'd like to talk to, about your book. You explain in this book that the, about the huge economic progress Chile has made under your leadership. But some say that it is all based on selling commodities to China, especially in regards to copper. What transformation does Chile need to make uh, to stop its dependence on commodities? I think that there are two things very important. First, because we have growth, we were able to reduce poverty. But once that you reduce poverty, those people that are leaving poverty behind, first, don't want to go back. They still feel rather vulnerable. They are afraid of going back. Second, they have new demands because they are not poor anymore. Major demand, education for the kids, and especially university education, because none of them has been able to have university education yet. After saying that, you are right. The question about commodities is true. The only way in order to prepare for that, most of the engineering that now is done in order to have new minings in Chile are done in Chile. In other words, you add value. It's not only a question of producing a commodity, but in the same way, it's possible then to add value like, for instance, that Chile now is almost the capital of the major engineering projects in the area of mining. In addition to that, of course, the question is that uh, we are exporting fruits or we are exporting wines 
And it's a different kind of uh, product that you're exporting. Or salmon, we are number th one or two in the world with regard to salmon, and salmon is being produced in Chile. And therefore, when you are exporting salmon, the color of that salmon is going to be different, depending to what country is being exported. So really, are you exporting a commodity or something unusual because you were able to produce that commodity? And this, I think, is important. Mr. President, you had just mentioned uh, poverty. I want you to talk about the income gap, this large gap between the rich and the poor that still exists in Chile, and, it, and as you mentioned, it will be a big issue in the upcoming election. What needs to be done to shrink this gap between the rich and the poor? Well, it's one thing to reduce the gap between rich and poor, or in other words, it's one thing to reduce poverty, and it's quite a different thing to improve income distribution. And in the same vein that I'm rather proud for what we accomplished, reducing poverty, it's not to be proud that after 20 years, distribution of income, the uneven distribution of income, remains almost the same. What is more to worry about is that now that we are approaching 15 to $18,000 per capita income, there is a very clear correlation. You increase per capita income, and you solve many social and economic problems. Well, in but the problem is that after $20,000 per capita income, the real correlation is between distribution of income and not the size of the income. And therefore now, the big question is, are we going to be able to improve income distribution? Number two, European countries improve distribution of income after paying taxes. In Chile, unfortunately, like in other Latin American countries, income distribution remains the same before or after taxes. Something has to be done now with regard to our taxation in order to have a better income distribution. I know to improve the distribution of income is more than taxation. That's taxation help. In the long run, is education the only way to have a better distribution of income? Well, you mentioned education. That is also a very important issue there with demonstrations that have been taking place there in the country over the last few years now. Uh, and your candidate, Michelle Bachelet, is promising free education for uni university students. Do you think the government can afford paying for that? Well, that's the point, because the education is not free. Somebody has to pay for that. And therefore, when uh, Madame Bachelet is talking about the free education, what they are saying is that students that cannot afford will not pay. And in the long run, if you want that everybody got free education, that means that the upper income groups, it's true, will not pay education for their kids, but they have a much higher taxes because somebody has to pay for that. In other words, in many countries it's possible to have free education, that depends what kind of taxes are you going to have. And therefore, I think that it's very important to understand that uh, the only way to have a sense of living in a society with equal opportunities is to have uh, equal access to education, and not the fact that access to education depends on the size of the pocket of your parents. All right, President Ricardo Lagos, it was a pleasure having you on the show, a great honor. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for the invitation.